Thanks. So the title of my talk is The Joy of Connecting Elixir to the Physical World. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm an embedded uh, programmer. I've been doing this uh, all my career. So I mostly live in C and C++. I connect devices. And I really so um, start working on the NERVS project. And uh, when, um, so recently, NERVS has become a little bit more popular and has gotten a few more people involved with uh, working with hardware in the Elixir community. And I really wanted to uh, make a talk or give a talk on how to get started with hardware in Elixir, because I think Elixir has some really interesting pieces to it. Um, I came to the, um, so from, from my point of view, I came to the Erlang community um, because I was very interested in uh, some aspects of OTP. But um, Elixir has, some, uh, has many great things and certainly builds on what's there. And uh, I wanted to share the, um, um, some ways that uh, you can avoid some pain. And uh, um, to that effect, um, this is what we're going to talk about. So the, uh, there are really three parts of, uh, there are three ways of interacting, or three main ways of interacting with uh, hardware when you're uh, using Elixir. And one, of course, is nerves. So, uh, of course, a favorite one. And I'll give a little, a little blurb about that um, if you haven't seen that yet. The other one is uh, using um, um, these desktop Linux, uh, so that I guess the, the term in, in my field is single board computer, so this is Raspberry Pi, BeagleBone. Talk a little bit more about that, about how you can actually get pretty far on these boards. And then the other thing that I think is completely underrated is uh, interacting with hardware on your laptop, but you need to know where to look. I think you need to know the trick to, for how to get started on that route. So I'll talk about those and give a couple examples for, um, of uh, projects that have gone these routes. So NERVS. So NERVS, uh, this, is, uh, um, this is a project that uh, I started um, three or a little bit over, over three years ago. Um, and the idea was just to combine um, OTP releases with uh, um, a, a Linux, a small Linux-based system. Um, so that uh, I could uh, do what our technical line says, is craft and, craft and deploy bulletproof embedded software. And uh, as things have picked up, especially, um, I'd like to thank this community because you guys have been unbelievably good and, um, and welcoming to me in this project. And certainly Justin and um, Garth um, really um, helped me get back into it with the, uh, and bring Elixir to the forefront with the project. And they've certainly contributed in an insane amount, so I don't want to take anything away from that. But uh, so nerves. So what are what are some of the key things in nerves? If you haven't used it before, you might have this nebulous feel for what's nerves, what's not. Well, nerves is actually basically the tooling, and there's some there's some basic common infrastructure for embedded uh, systems projects that's included within you know the the main part of NERVS. Now, there's certainly a lot of other things that people do with NERVS, but you can kind of think about it as like Phoenix and all the ecosystem that Phoenix has. NERVS has the core part, and you can, um, there are many ways of extending in projects that build upon it. So it's a tooling. It, uh, when you start to use it, you'll get a different feel. It's not really batteries included. It's kind of the opposite. It starts small, and then you add on the pieces you need. Um, this is something that has appealed to me quite a bit in, in my career because it's um, the projects that I tend to work on. It's good for me to know what the ingredients are. And the, I think the downside of starting big with batteries included is that it's kind of hard to figure out where all the moving parts are and where they're going. Now, on the opposite side, starting small and building up, you need to know what to add. So, so I'll briefly mention a couple ways of dealing with that and, and um, making that part a little bit easier. It's cross-compiled. We've always been cross-compiled. And uh, the main reason has been, has been that we've been targeting hardware that is really not fun at all to do development on. on. So you work on your laptop or some nice build machine, and it produces a little piece of firmware that runs on that piece of hardware. Um, now, Another part that may have been more controversial will surprise people if there are any embedded Linux people here is it's that the li embedded Linux ecosystem uh, overlaps with the Erlang OTP ecosystem of, uh, of uh, componentry in um, various ways. We tend to choose the Erlang Elixir ways. If you've, as 
um, which probably don't find surprising, but sometimes it has ramifications because you'll go look things up on the web for like, how do I do this thing with DNS? And you find out that, well, we don't use uh, some of the, uh, the embedded Linux tools for doing um, basic uh, operations, either with DNS, we use Erlang's route, or um, with a couple other um, um, pieces. So this is the, let me just move on to the, the big diagram. So if there's one thing to remember about nerves, this is it. All you have to do is remember this picture and you'll never be lost. And there are two, there are two sides of this picture. So there's, there's the bottom side and the top side. The bottom side is, describes what happens. Um, it's uh, um, the p parts that we put together, mostly on our side, and then um, if you get to be an advanced user, you'll, you may dig into this yourself. But it basically includes Linux, C, the C libraries. All that stuff gets comp compiled and then built into something called a system image. And uh, we distribute system images, so you get one for your platform. And then, you know, they can, they'll download, if you have in your mix file, you can reference these and they'll be, they'll be downloaded to your system automatically. So it's all really nice. And then on the other part of it, um, the top side, this is where most of your development hopefully lives. If, you're, if it doesn't live there, then you're probably not using Elixir that much. But uh, the idea is you set up Elixir, your Elixir projects the normal ways. We have a helper called MixNerves.new, which will, which will template things out to get you started. But you set it up, use the standard uh, um, Elixir tools to build things, and now we go to an OTP release. So once you get to the re release, there's some additional steps with Nerve. So the release, for, the, um, for those of you who aren't familiar, contains all the Beam files that are compiled um, and some initialization scripts, mostly to handle the uh, Elixir and Erlang side. Those need to be married with uh, the uh, system component tree, the Linux kernel. And that gets created in, in a firmware image, which for those of you with Raspberry Pis, that gets converted into, um, you, you'd write that onto an SD card, which you could then plug in. Um, for those of you who might be doing something professionally with this, where you're not using SD card, you have built in memory, um, that would uh, be programmed either in um, production or manufacturing step, and then there'd be upgrades that you could ship out to your device. Um, using whatever uh, method you have for communicating with your device that could be, apply new firmware images. So that's about, that's about the uh, extent which I'm gonna get to go into nerves. If you want to uh, um, know more about it, uh, you can consult our website or there have been several other talks that uh, you can watch on it. So the main part I want to get are the two are the underserved parts of interacting with hardware. And this is just, why not get a Raspberry Pi um, and uh, install Erlang and Elixir on it and just run from it. So, so you can get these, you don't, you're not stuck with the Raspberry Pi, there are hundreds of them. And uh, the neat thing about this is that if, you, if your project needs some IOs that the Raspberry Pi doesn't have, maybe you need an FPGA or, which FPGA is a really low level hardware way of uh, um, um, performing some hard real time action. So you can get, these fancy ones, you can, um, a lot of them come with Debian, so with like the Raspberry Pi, you get Raspbian, which is really Debian repackaged. And they work like real computers, so if you're new to this, it's really easy to interoperate because it's just like a really slow um, PC. Um, I do have to say one thing on this, and I learned this the hard way, um, actually a couple times, which is kind of embarrassing, which is just like you wouldn't pick your laptop based just on, solely on hardware specs, don't just pick these boards based solely on hardware specs. And, and sometimes these boards look so cool that you just want to pick them up and just play with it and then you find out this software is really, really bad um, or really old and ancient and unmaintained. So that's just, that's just a note there just when you're looking for boards. So Raspberry, the ones I mentioned here are, are very good. They're, out, um, they're outstanding, the Raspberry Pi and BeagleBone. And there are several others that are, that are good. All right, so Debian, um, what's great about it? Well, everyone uses it, so if you actually want to get help, which, you know, we're a small community, we're kind of new on the hardware side, so it's not like Stack Overflow has tons and tons of, like, how you do, you know, how you do this in Elixir, how you talk to this device. Most often, you're going to find out how you work with a device with Python or some other language. So the good news is that when you're on this board, you can always try it out in one of those other languages or post your questions, and uh, you'll get some response. 
The bad part is that you're building Erlang from scratch almost always because um, for whatever reason, a lot of these boards have Erlang 17 or earlier, which doesn't have maps, so is uh, less useful. And I guess if anyone happens to be here who knows how to um, work with, the, with Debian um, in ways to update their packages for Erlang, please let me know. I'd really love it if I didn't have to rebuild these as often. Um, I guess one note here, if you're working on the Raspberry Pi, Erlang Solutions has that totally fixed. Um, you can just get their package off their website. All right, so now those are, the, those are two of the routes. So the Nerds and Desktop Linux, they have similar capabilities in what you can do with them. So I wanted to go over a uh, particular application, application which has gotten more, um, um, has brought up, come up a few times on, our, on the Nerf support list, which is uh, uh, monitoring your garden. So I don't know why this year it's monitoring your garden. Other years it was uh, making beer, but this year seems to be the garden one. So here's, here's what comes up. So, so what you do, um, apparently people can't remember to water their plants. Um, I have this problem too, so, but you have a Raspberry Pi and you want to actually do something with it. So you want to um, connect some sort of moisture sensor to the Pi and uh, use it to monitor the soil so you know when to water. So it's nothing super complicated, but when we get into the details, you'll see it can be a little tricky and it actually turns out to be more interesting than I thought when, I first, uh, when people first started asking about this and I changed my presentation to include it and you'll see why. So here's... Uh, Here's the setup. So you get a moisture sensor. On them, probably you, some of you have seen this, where it has two prongs. And the idea of these sensors is that uh, you, know, you apply a voltage, it goes down one prong, and then you basically see how much of it comes out the other side to see how conductive the soil is. Now that's, that's analog. And uh, for those of you with Raspberry Pis, you'll know they don't have any analog inputs. They can't, if you, it, it, um, the analog, um, input and you can't give it like three volts and it'll, it'll tell you that's three volts that it got. So you need to have some chip in between to do the translation. So they're analog to digital converters. They're like millions of these, but uh, a very inexpensive one and um, easy to solder one is this uh, MCP3008 and if you go to a lot of websites, they'll point you to this one. So anyway, it takes analog in on, on one pin and then converts it to something called SPI. So SPI is a, is a particular digital interface. It's one of a couple that are, are very popular um, in, embedded, in embedded systems and hardware. So the pins, those pins on the upper left corner of that Pi, there's some that are SPI inputs. So we take that, and then, then the other piece of um, information that you need to know is how do you access it in software? And there's, um, if you search hex.pm for SPI, you should get Elixir Ale, and that's uh, a library that's been around quite a while, but it has interfaces to let you talk to spy peripherals. So what does that look like? So the first thing, you know, most of us do is like, all right, we have these inputs and outputs, so, um, so let's match all the APIs together to see how, see what we need to, our programs to do to glue them all together. So you look at the, the hex docs for Elixir Ale, and for spy, there's one function. So, all right, so this, this ought to be good because how hard can it be with one function? So it, the neat thing about the spy bus is that it sends, it, you transmit and receive simultaneously. So it's not like I send a byte and then I get a byte back. It's like I send and receive a, a byte at the same time. And this is kind of strange, but uh, um, in a couple slides, you'll see why this makes, makes sense. And uh, it's actually quite a simple way to um, implement hardware. One thing, I guess the other thing when you deal with hardware and, and the APIs for hardware, you'll find out that things are a lot simpler than you may expect them to, and sometimes simpler enough that you just can't believe that it actually just works that way. So sometimes you have to just take a step back and um, um, just look at it fresh while like, what, what would be the simplest thing for turning wires on and off? So we got this function. So now what we need to do, and we need to find the API to this chip. So in hardware speak, API is a uh, data sheet. And uh, there should, so those of you who have looked up data sheets before, it has a lot of scary stuff in it, but um, the good stuff isn't here. This is the real API. This is the document that you need to go to. 
um, to find these, in, and Google will get you there. So in this case, here's the web page for the MCP 3008, and at the bottom there's a link to download the data sheet. Then you have to take the step of searching for the most important diagram, which is, which looks like this. And I'll explain this. And, and so if you're totally new, you might want to just, and, and you're working this, you might want to read up on SPY, but I can tell you real quick how SPY works. So SPY, there, there are three wires. Actually, this shows four wires, this diagram. But uh, the top wire, um, we can ignore that for now. That fourth wire is used to tell the chip that you're actually talking to it. And the way these things are hooked up quite often is you're always talking to the chip. So the three next wires, uh, the, the one called CLK, that stands for clock, and then DN, that's data in and data out. So data in, you know, this is chip-centric, since this is the talk from the chip. So data in would be coming from the Raspberry Pi to the, that uh, um, analog to digital converter. So the way this works is when you send and receive over the SPI bus, the Raspberry Pi twiddles, you know, sends one, sets it to zero volts, and then sets it to three volts, so zero, one, zero, one, so that's the, the clock twiddles. So every twiddle is a bit that goes through. So, so here's how it works. The, the, the first bit, yeah, that one, it's called the start bit, and if you read the doc, the sections I didn't uh, copy, it says set that to one, okay. Then there's a mode bit, and well, and there's a little paragraph that, sets it, that tells you how to set that right above that, so that's good. There's address bits. Um, if we went back to the picture of that chip, you notice they had a whole lot of pins. Well, you can, you can take input from um, a whole bunch of moisture sensors if you were interested in it. So they have an address, so that's, that's probably not too hard. Then uh, there are 10 bits in the result. So, that, so 10 bits, you know, 0 to 1,023 is what you get back. And 1,023 means you're getting a lot of volts. Yeah, um, you're getting close to three volts or, or five volts, depending on how you run the chip. Um, and then zero, um, get back zero, then it's, it's zero volts. So, so you know if, if you have um, a lot of moisture in your soil, you're gonna get a high number. If you don't have much, you're gonna get a low number. And then you, know, you play around with this a little bit and calibrate it and you figure out what the good number is. So let's just complete this. You get a uh, um, couple more bits in there because you count the twiddles and then this is what happened. So it came to 17 bits, and then, and, uh, this, this actually prompted the uh, post to the list, which was, uh, I don't know what to do with 17 bits. So, so you know, it, those of you who've done bit strings and with Elixir, you're like, oh, I can do 17 bits, but, but that's not really good enough. The uh, spy interface uh, takes bytes. So you're like, oh, 17 bits, did I count it right? And I actually counted this. I, an embarrassing number of times to make sure it was actually 17 bits because who makes an interface that uh, gives you numbers um, in, some, in uh, fractions of bytes? And, um, and actually, as you, if, you, if any of you work with hardware people, you, you start finding out that this is not uncommon. I don't know why they do that to us, but uh, they do. So, so then what do you do when you, uh, um, when you don't know how to use an API? Well, you look for examples. So the word for example, in hardware speak is application note. So, so all right, so you go, you start Googling app, app note, right? They, they often shorten it. And then you get a diagram like this, and you're like, oh, okay, so it's hopefully, I really hope this is helpful. And uh, it actually turns out to be helpful. Um, it wasn't immediately obvious, but if you look at the bottom two rows, they're groups of eight bits, so you have bytes. So they said, okay, here's what you do. If you can only send and receive bytes, well, just make the first byte, um, just put one bit, the start bit in that. So you send a one, and then you know, 17 minus one is 16 bits. So, so if we were to go back to the previous diagram, um, that, then you'd see that the first the start bit, and then the, the rest are the uh, 16 other bits. So what we need to do on the top is send a one, and then send the, uh, send the mode and the address, and then the X's mean don't care, so we can just send zeros because that's easy enough. Um, and, in, and then on the receive side, they're basically saying, question mark, we don't know what we're gonna give you, so don't look at it. So we just have to ignore, I think that's like, what, 14 things or 13 things that we have to ignore, and then we get a zero, they'll, 
we definitely get a zero, and then, uh, and then we get the good stuff, the, the value. So what does that look, so three bytes, yes. So what does that look like in Elixir? And um, this, is, this, was actually, this is actually one of the coolest things to me. So if you look at the, uh, so spike transfer, if you look at that second parameter, you pass, pass a one, and then uh, the mode, size, and so, so I have size of one, so one bit. The sensor, which is the address, so it has a size of three, so three bits. And then, then we're gonna send 12 bits of zeros. So we do that spike transfer, and then on the receive inside, that um, with the pi pattern match, we, we just ignore the first 14 bits and uh, use the, the, the 10. And this is, I, I, I actually almost can't imagine a more concise way of uh, expressing this. And I, so I want to impress upon everyone here that uh, with so many, so many uh, with the, our interactions with hardware, so many times you have to go through a library, right? So there's a lot of stuff encapsulated in libraries. And like going through a library is great. We need this, this abstraction. But the uh, problem is, is if anything goes wrong, right, what, what are we doing? We're, we have to look at the, see how things are implemented in the library, and we eventually have to look at the data sheet. Well, this matches almost directly with, uh, uh, with what the data sheet says, except in possibly more friendly terms. So if anything goes wrong, well, we have the data sheet here. You can just compare and look. And more often than not, it's you want to do something that your library doesn't support, and uh, you just want to tweak it a little bit. And because you know you run the data sheet that this device can definitely do this, but then you have to cut through all these layers of abstractions. And Elixir makes this so nice and simple that you got that you just have just what you need right there. And um, this is not some isolated example of a device. There are so many devices that are just as simple as this that end up with code like this, and you're almost questioning, do I even bundle this in a module? Um, because it's so easy. All right, so, so that's the first part. And uh, this, this next part of the talk is going to be about what you do when you want to uh, work with hardware on your laptop. And so the, I mean, obviously, the laptop is really nice, right? Most of you, all of you probably are very comfortable working with your laptop already, so if you're gonna, and maybe you haven't done anything with hardware, so changing as little as possible to do stuff is, is highly desirable. There's actually quite a bit that you can do, but of course, the, the drawback is it's on your laptop, and if you want to, if you're building something and want to have it monitor something 24-7 or do something, I mean, you, you're not buying laptops all the time, right? That'd be, that'd be silly. But, uh, um, and the other problem is the, despite how fast your laptop is, the interfaces to connect the hardware from your laptop are a little slower than what you can get on, on a Raspberry Pi and BeagleBone. So, so here's the thing. Um, um, often, you know, someone who'd, who'd present this would say, okay, use a serial port. So um, I'm gonna call it a UART, and because that's what it's called in pretty much everything that I use. So there are differences, so those of you who are who know this know that there, there are details here that I'm skipping, but uh, you will see this term frequently in, in some of the, uh, um, in the data sheets and other documents for these devices. So you are, briefly, universal asynchronous receiver transmitter. Three wires um, is what these things normally have. So receive, transmit, ground. Um, they do kind of the obvious things. Ground, of course, that has to be connected to everything that you work with, and then receive and transmit. The, they toggle the bit, toggle the line to send bits, or or you look at the line to see how it's toggled. If you want to receive something, um, if you haven't used a serial port before, just think TCP, except you manually hook up the connection, things don't work, um, and sometimes oh, bit bytes drop, bits, you know, all sorts of bad things that probably won't happen to you all that much until you actually start letting other people use your stuff. So, so that's that. So why do we, why do we stick around with this, uh, um, this kind of technology? Well, it's dirt simple and it's everywhere, everywhere and embedded. I mean, it's, you can think of any number of, of ways to communicate between chips, um, but this UART has hung around there, and I think what it comes down to is it's really easy to debug, right? If you want to just test to see if the wires work, right, you can took a, stick a paper clip and tie together receive and transmit, and then on your computer have a terminal and say, you know, type AAA, and does it come back? No, you, there's probably a break in the wire. If it comes back, then, 
At least that part works. So there's, there's a lot of aspects that are pretty easy to debug. Um, it's, of course, wired, a wired technology. Um, there's lots of options to make this go wireless. Of course, once you start, you start talking about wireless, there are other things, other options that you may want to consider. All right, the uh, key thing that you need is a USB to serial cable. So all of you that uh, came to the workshop, we gave these out um, at the workshop. But this is like the best piece of equipment that uh, you can get, and they're not that expensive. Um, it's, uh, there are some details to this, so I wanted to post this up here so that anyone, when, if, when you go to buy one, um, just to keep some of these attributes in mind, so logic, it will have a spec that says logic voltage level, so that's the receive and transmit wires, so the idea is, is that if you're talking to something that only likes three volts, don't give it five volts, right? So, I mean, nice thing. So logic voltage level to, um, is that almost always you're going to be working in the three volt for probably most of what you do with Elixir. I think most of the five volt things are at least much less common now. Um, the uh, other part is um, they sell them with uh, see how the wires are apart. The other way they sell them is with the wires stuck together in one line. So that's called a six-pin header. Um, that is actually convenient. If you really like the BeagleBone Black and there are a couple other things, they have the six-pin headers so you can just plug it on. When you have the wires apart, what happens is, is you plug in one wire into the wire that you think is received or the, the place is received, another one into transmit, and then you find out that you got them backwards and things don't work. So you keep, it's kind of like USB. You know how you plug it in one way, then turn it over and plug it in the other way, then keep on doing that. Well, it's the same idea when you have them apart. But it, it doesn't matter. You, you actually don't hurt anything if you make that mistake. Then the convenience is some of these come with 5 volt power supplies, so that little red wire on there. Um, that will supply 5 volts, so you can actually power the thing that you're, you're talking to as well, um, which is very convenient. Um, some names to look for, FTDI, Prolific. And I only put this, so, so if you go to a reputable place, you don't have to worry about this, but there are clone chips out there, and I got duped a couple times, I think by being cheap, um, when I needed a few more, and these, if you're on Linux, no problem, you're fine. It seems like the clone chips always work on Linux, but Mac and Windows, they give you um, unknown pain that, uh, you know, it's kind of the last thing that you need when you're getting into hardware. Okay, so let's do something with this. And uh, a fun thing to do is, is just to find out where you are with GPS. And um, the GPS modules, there are actually tons of these. They, uh, most of them work the same, a similar way, and they have a uh, UART interface. So this is, this is one that's, that's actually pretty easy to plug into, so I took a picture of it. But if you look at the, the holes on the left side, um, the bottom four, so the VN, that's voltage in, um, so you, you give it five volts, or the next one's ground, and then receive transmit. So if you actually had that uh, USB to serial connector that I showed before on the previous page, you just connect those, uh, those wires to those four ports, and you're good, and you can use GPS on your project. And so we're going to connect it up to your computer, um, your laptop, so you can, you can do some development with, uh, with the GPS chip. And uh, um, I guess uh, the, the, from the software side, um, these GPS chips come with little documentation that says uh, how, how they report things. And there's a spec called NMEA 0183, and uh, it tells you the format. And I'm not even going to show this spec because I, I actually think that most people um, will kind of glean um, the basics just from seeing it. So the, uh, you get this chip, you connect it to the computer, then you need some software in Elixir to talk to it. And uh, one of these is this, this library called NERVS UART. So NERVS UART um, has the C code that uh, knows how to talk to the serial ports. So there's actually another one called Serial. So both of them work. Um, so I'm going to demo, um, well, not, not exactly demo. I'm just going to show you some slides of, of how this looks when you connect it up. So the way I normally, when I get a new device, I just want to play around with it. So I bring it up, um, bring up an IAX uh, session um, it, with Nerves UART. First thing is, where is the device connected to your computer? So on, this, this is on Linux. So, so you call Nerves UART and enumerate. And, uh, um, you get that one you are connected on, on TTY USB 0, and it gives a couple descriptions on it. If you're on Windows, then you'll get like COM5 or COM6. And, and Mac, this is really helpful because uh, 
you get some TTY CU dot blah, 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 and it's really long and easy to make a mistake to type in, but you can, you can enumerate them, um, figure out which one is the right one. If you actually go into producing devices, you can set a lot of those fields so that your program know, can look through and pick the right one. So that's kind of neat. So the next thing is, is we're gonna open it up. So the first thing to do is to start the Nerve UART gen server and then uh, open. So there are a couple parameters to open. Well, what are you gonna open? TTY USB zero, just like we showed in the last slide. Um, serial ports all have speeds. So those of you from the modem days, we're back at 9600 baud. And we're okay with that because GPS only updates so quickly, so it's not a problem. Last parameter is called is uh, whether you want active mode or not. So active mode is a, a new UART feature. There are two ways of working with devices. Um, so one's passive mode. So passive mode, you you write out and then you you call read to to uh, get more data. And uh, the reason why passive mode is interesting is um, sometimes you just want to set a configuration on the serial port and be done with it, so it's kind of nice to have that inline code to where you write and read directly. The other interesting part is when you get into flow control. If you don't call read, um, the serial port eventually turns on, on flow control and stops the sender from sending you new stuff. Um, the alternative mode is active mode, which um, you still send the same way, but uh, when you receive stuff, you receive it in messages. So let's just see what happens. So connect it up to GPS called read, and uh, we'll get back a big string of all the stuff that the GPS chip sent, and I fully didn't take it apart, but if you stare at it long enough, you can kind of glean some slash r slash ins, so, so it sends you stuff that's line-based, and then there are a bunch of commas, so I think uh, um, if you're thinking that this is CSV, that's uh, pretty close to it. So anyway, start there, start seeing stuff, and you're like, okay, well, let me try to integrate this into my app. So I know in my app I'm gonna make some gen server and I wanna receive events whenever the GPS reports a new position. So this passive mode stuff, this was fun and all, but let's switch to active mode. So let's just see what happens there. So you switch to active mode, um, and then all of a sudden um, you look at what messages you get and then you're like, oh shoot, I got a message for each character. Um, and uh, you know, first time you see this, it might not be obvious what happened, but at 9600 baud, your computer's doing a lot of waiting. So, you know, it, it, sends a, it, gets a, it gets a byte in, then, you know, like a few billion cycles go by, then it gets the next, uh, next byte. So you end up getting messages one at a time, which um, is kind of annoying since you kind of have to accumulate things, but it's actually worse than that because you're not guaranteed to get one byte at a time. You could get two, you can get any number. Um, so there's, uh, there's uh, a process with Nerves UART. So it can, break the, it can accumulate things and give you um, the messages from the device in nice little chunks that are easy to parse, so you don't have to write, to, you don't have to aggregate the data on your end. Um, I, I think that this is one of the things, if you've actually implemented this, it's a little trickier than it seems on, on first blush. So, um, so anyway, um, with Nurse UART, there's a behavior, you can, you can implement behavior for how this uh, framing is um, set up, but for so many devices, things are line-based, so there's a built-in one, and you just specify that, and you say that the separator, you know, slash r slash in like we saw, and then what you get, you get uh, what you'd expect, all the nice little lines with uh, the messages. So, and then for those of you who, who may not know what, have never seen the, the 0183 stuff, you basically get, GP, you get a short little code, like GPGGA, to tell you where you're at, and if I let the GPS go a little bit longer, it'd give a little bit more interesting data there, and you'd pull out your latitude and longitude. So that's, that's actually where I stopped with this, because I, actually, I thought that uh, for most of you, um, unbundling CSV data was, was sort of bread and butter, but getting the actual data was perhaps the harder part. Um, so if you're interested in hooking GPSs up, um, maybe if you're or working with them on the projects, this will get you started. There is a library out there that someone wrote that uh, decodes uh, these uh, messages that you get into nice little latitude, longitude, velocity, and all the other nice things that you can get from the GPS satellites and ships. Um, it's called XGPS, and it's on, it's on hex. So what else, what else can you do? Um, I think this is an age test. 
Um, so by the last, I, I hope some of you saw this, so otherwise I'm feeling kind of old. Um, <laughs> good, good. So ATDT, so those of us who lived before internet days, um, the way we would connect to other computers is through a modem and we'd type in ATDT, so that was dial, and we had seven digit phone numbers back in the old days. So we'd type that in. And actually, if you, well, so this is digital. Actually, I had to do pulse, so there's, so even more embarrassing. So the reason, why do I, why do I say this? It's because this, the whole AT command set, it's in tons in tons of chips. And uh, you'll see this um, if you want to uh, use any of these. So Bluetooth, cellular, um, satellite. So if you have a project where you want to um, communicate with my, locally or even um, if you're on a boat or something, you have to go to a satellite because you don't, hit, or you're someplace where, where um, where you're really remote, or if you just have some data collection app where you wanted to report in via cellular, well, you can use NerdGR to, to connect to that device over your base connection, and you type, well, your program types, AT, and then they'll docu then you can look at the, the specs for that for what commands you might want to send. Um, it's very useful, so, it's, and, it's, and it's very easy to use, and the reason why I point this out is even if you're not going to deploy this on your laptop, you can do all the development on your laptop. And I think that's very important, especially if you're new to the field, is to stay on your laptop as long as you can, get some of the kinks worked out, or maybe feel a little bit more comfortable, and then move on to NERVs or, or move on to a Raspberry Pi so that you're just, you're incrementally um, um, getting more familiar with, uh, with uh, this kind of uh, business. So the next thing I want to point out was just the, just the gem that's uh, out there that you can do, which some, at, at some, sometimes I feel it's a little silly, but uh, I wanted to explain why it's not. So that's uh, connecting to an Arduino. So, so you can just get any, any Arduino, plug in USB to your computer, and it can talk over the serial port. Um, it actually makes a virtual serial port, so it's accessible in Nerves UART. Um, if you install, if you go through the Arduino IDE, there's this thing called Formata, and Formata is just a simple protocol to let you remote control your Arduino. Um, what's, what's neat about that is that uh, when you can remote control your Arduino from, from Elixir, um, you can access all these IOs and, and uh, shields and everything in the Arduino ecosystem on your, uh, on your laptop. Um, so there's, if you're interested in doing this, there's, we, we actually have a Formata library in Elixir. It's, it's there, it's kind of sad right now because it's looking for a maintainer, but um, it's uh, actually quite convenient to use this and I would encourage anyone to step in and help out with this. I'm, I know I certainly will be helping out a little bit in the near term to get to a place so it's more convenient to others, but uh, it, it would be nice to get this going more. And I, I, w I need to mention this um, because I have, a, I have another talk that I give on how do you architect nerves-based systems or actually any embedded Linux system. And this is uh, one of the takeaway slides. That's uh, for a lot of embedded, so these are special purpose devices. You have a bigger, fancier processor, an ARM chip or, or MIPS or x86 that handles all your web, you know, the web page, the GUI, command and control. There's all this other infrastructure that handles. So you have it right here, and, and you're running on Elixir, so it's all software real time. And then you have a microcontroller off to the side that handles the hard real time pieces. And the reason you do that is because developing hard real time pieces, even though they're very simple, you know, they have these short deadlines and they need to work predictably, it's a lot easier to think about um, their correctness and uh, test their performance out in the context of a nice little chip where it's unencumbered by all these other pieces of software running right next to it. And I mean, it's not, you're not worrying about Linux interrupts somehow making this thing go, you know, get delayed by a fraction of a microsecond would end up, you know, causing a hiccup in your, um, on your device. So you, you, you use these, you have this setup where you have the two processors and you communicate via, um, between them via like a UR connection. Actually, there are a lot of other buses that you can use, but uh, since we're talking about UARTs, I put that one there, and it's not uncommon to see that. Um, so that uh, hooking up that Arduino to your laptop is totally a real thing um, it's, that has analogs in uh, professional embed devices. 
All right, so we've gone through the main routes. So, so how do they compare? Um, what's the summary here for when you should use one or the other? Now, the, uh, so, if you're using, so, so the first step is where are you doing your development? So laptop, nerve to art, you know, you're, you're on your PC, that's, uh, or your laptop in, in that I call a host. Um, if you're on NERVS or the desktop Linux, you're, the target's involved. So NERVS has a hybrid approach where there's both, you're work, doing some work on your laptop and the tipping over firmware to the target. And then the desktop Linux one is uh, basically you work directly on the target like it's, a, it's, on, it's your own little computer. Um, other things to consider. So, so really the, this, the performance and the amount of disk space really matters when you're developing on the device. So the desktop, the Raspberry Pis, you kind of want to make sure that they're fast enough. For those of you who have worked on them, if you get like the original Raspberry Pi and you start doing too much stuff on it, you it gets a little frustrating. Um, and uh, um, what if you if you're compiling Erlang or Elixir, um, some on some of these devices that I've used, um, they, the compile times are like half a day or a day. So it's kind of painful. So. So get one that's fast and and uh, and don't put yourself in this pain. And if you you know if you want to work on a Raspberry or if you eventually want to use a Raspberry Pi Zero, maybe do some early work on Raspberry Pi Three, right? So this it's, it's a little faster. Um, support devices. This is where it gets into um, um, what you can hook up. So so obviously on if you're using your laptop, it's whatever goes over your. But uh, um, the other two nerves and desktop Linux are pretty much just limited by what's on the board. Whereas, uh, um, um, with if you if you start out with the desktop Linux or Raspbian, all the drivers are included. So often I start out there, and I you know if I don't know what I'm doing, I start out there. Then I kind of see like what are the pieces that I didn't know existed that I'm using, um, and uh, and when I get that list, then I add them to my nerves configuration. That makes things a lot easier. Because you can, you can do everything on NERVS, you just need to know what you need to add. Uh, let's see, a couple other things, the tools, well, you can read it as well as I can. Um, deployment, I think deployment's interesting when you get into production, or you want to start sharing this with a lot of people, and uh, um, the, uh, things get easier as you get to, as you get to NERVS. I think uh, this is one area where we focus a lot on, um, fortunately not everything's open source um, yet, but uh, um, being able to send around small packages that have the code that runs on the device is quite nice, and things you, things update a lot more quickly. And uh, you can do things like sign the packages, and that's so that if you're concerned about someone mucking with your uh, firmware midstream, you can do stuff like that. Whereas the others, it's not quite as obvious how you do it, and things are a little bit slower. So I guess the the key thing is when do I use this? And I use all three, like I said in the beginning. And I highly encourage uh, all of you not to think that, you know, I want to do Elixir and I want to connect to hardware. Um, the, if, no matter how much I want you to go to NERVS, because this is really a fun project for me, that's not always the right answer. So, um, so check, check with yourself. You know, if you can do something on your laptop through a UART, buy one of those USB to serial cables, it's actually quite a nice experience. So it's, and um, I actually find myself when I can, when I have some setup that's similar to that, doing a lot of development there. Um, the, uh, the desktop Linux one, if you uh, have a lot of confusion with NERVS, um, go there, see how um, Debian or Raspbian or um, whatever the operating system or the board vendor did, how they solved the problem. Um, usually it's a lot simpler than you think, but when you don't know what you're doing, it's nice to check in. And so then the last one, NERVS, when you want to when, to, when you want to do this uh, for real, or and there are actually quite a few cases where nerves actually make some things easier. So you might go to the laptop, new, you might uh, um, skip over the middle one and go straight to nerves. But uh, that's that's uh, that's the gist. That's how I look at it. And if you want to find out more about the two projects that I talked mostly about, the nerves UART and Elixir L, those are um, they're on GitHub, of course, and they're also on Hex. So you can find them there on Twitter. Um, you can find me there at Funlist and at, uh, I'm at Nerves Project too. So, so Nerves Project, of course, is central to Nerves, but we certainly cover a lot of other things that uh, are of interest in general. Um, the Elixir Lang Slack, 
um, has, I think, become the de facto channel, uh, de, de facto channel to go to on Slack if you want to do anything embedded. Um, there are other channels, but uh, we actually have quite a few people that answer um, questions, embedded questions. So it's, it's really cool that uh, if you need a little bit of help there, you can go there. And of course, if you're doing something professionally and you get stuck or just want to have a little bit of help, um, feel free to contact me. This is, this is what I do to keep this hobby um, and uh, this project going. So it always makes me happy to help someone else put this into production. So you can email me there. So that's, that's what I got. And I, I think we're out of time, but I'll take questions afterwards. I'll be around.